Welcome to the Catholic Community Scripture Study held at St. John the Evangelist Catholic Church in Jackson, Michigan. I will be your host, Todd Gale, as we walk our way through the book of Genesis, a line-by-line study of the first book of the Sacred Scriptures. Hi friends, we have a lot of ground to cover today. So last week we talked about how Egypt was one of the most racially separated countries on earth, right? A society that was completely separated. They believed that Egyptians came from the gods and all other people were lesser creatures. So how did Joseph climb the rank so quickly as a Hebrew? Um, Well, there's a lot of different thoughts. Um, We're told that the union of Joseph and Asenath was actually an arranged marriage by Pharaoh himself. I mean, think about it. The new viceroy, the the vizier, right, the the right-hand man of Pharaoh, Joseph, is a former slave. He's an accused rapist. He's from another land. He is not from a powerful family. He doesn't worship the Egyptian gods. Why in the world would they allow him to marry a priest's daughter? Well, back in chapter 41, verse 45, Pharaoh gave Joseph a new Egyptian name, and he gave him a wife, Azanath, right? The daughter of Potipharah, priest of An. Many scholars in Jewish legend actually says Potiphar, the captain of the guard, and Potipharah, the priest of An, are the same fella. It's an unusual name. It's not found often in Egypt, and it's directly connected to the god Ra. The name means he whom Ra gave. So it's possible Potiphar is actually the father of Joseph's wife. Well, imagine the tension that would happen with Mrs. Potiphar. She's the one that tried to seduce Joseph, right? So the soap opera continues and all that. But normally an outsider would never be allowed to have contact with Egyptians like this. So what's going on? It appears that Pharaoh broke the rules for Joseph. Basically, in order for Joseph to do what he does, Pharaoh makes him an Egyptian. He's given a change of clothes and a haircut like the Egyptians. He's given a new name like the Egyptians. He's given a title and a role as an Egyptian. He's even given an Egyptian wife. So the outer name and the outer clothing and all that, it really demonstrates he's a new man. He's a remade person. Some writers think that Joseph was literally adopted by Pharaoh. Thus, Pharaoh has the authority to give him a new name and a wife. So sometimes it appears that the customs, though, that are closer to home with the with the average person, like that's a little more personal. It appears the Egyptians still don't want to eat at the same table with Joseph. And I was just thinking that, you know, he's, he's kind of kept at arm's length in the previous chapter, verses 32, um, in, 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 in uh, chapter 43, verse 32, it talks about how Joseph is sitting at a different table to eat. No, 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 I found another little tidbit that makes it fit. Yes, the Egyptians did not want to eat at the same table with the Canaanite shepherds. Ew, they smelled like ewes, right? Get it? Ewes, you know, sheep. Anyway, um, but if they didn't consider Joseph a foreigner, why did he have to eat at a separate table. Why didn't he eat with the Egyptians? Because the Egyptians would be separated by rank. And Joseph clearly outranked everyone else. He's not sitting at a kid's table off to the side. He's probably on an elevated platform and a table all by himself. So where we left off, the boys come back to Egypt with Benjamin. And Joseph has a great meal, and we we pointed to lots of connections with Jesus. And now we pick up in chapter 44. Joseph again puts money into the the bags of grain with his his brothers. And he tells the servant, also, put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack of the youngest, and Benjamin. So 
They're treated well. They have their sacks full of grain. Simeon's out of prison. They're heading back with full bellies and sacks full of wheat. And then the servant catches up with them and accuses them of stealing the silver cup. Now, the silver cup is a big deal. Well, it was made of silver, and there are virtually no silver deposits in Egypt. So, so silver is very rare. It's an instrument of worship, an instrument of religion. It was used to foresee the future, to talk to the gods and to tell the weather. And It's kind of like reading palms or tea leaves. It's called to divine. It's divination. The Egyptian magicians would use this often. Now, Scripture never says Joseph himself used it for magic. There's no hint that he ever worshipped the pagan gods. He, he clearly thought that God was the one that interpreted the dreams, and it was never magic in, in, in the sight of Joseph. Um, the, the servant does say that, that this is the cup that my master drinks from and divines from. And later on, Joseph is going to say, don't you know the truth? I can see all things mysteriously. I can divine, right? But it never says he actually uses it. He's probably just playing this up a bit. And all the rabbis pretty much unanimously teach that he never fell into Egyptian pagan practices. But nonetheless, he owns this magic silver cup, and he makes the people think he uses it for magic. And what is Jojo doing here? Why is he setting up Benjamin? Well, it's the final test of the brothers to see how they will react to their little brother. Benji is about to die. They're going to have the opportunity to leave him just like they left Joseph. Would they give him a little half-hearted attempt to save him? Or have they changed? Okay. And what's the difference here between a test and a temptation? Well, a temptation usually comes from Satan. The enemy's coming to set us up. He deliberately wants you to fail. But a test comes from God to see if you're morally strong. It's actually the test is usually more to prove to ourselves that we can pass the test. God knows what we're capable of. Notice the play on silver all throughout this whole story with Joseph and his brothers. Joseph sold for 20 pieces of silver. The word in Hebrew is kesef. Kesef is silver, or it can be money. So a lot of times it's called silver coins or silver pieces. Joseph is exchanged for 20 kesef to Egypt. And then the 10 brothers bring money. They bring kesef to pay for the grain on their first trip to Egypt. Then Joseph returns the 10 kesef back into their backpacks. And when the 10 brothers come back to Egypt, they bring with them 20 kesef to buy Egyptian food. It's the same amount that the Ishmaelites paid to buy Joseph as an Egyptian slave. And when the brothers set out to return to Canaan, Joseph has again returned the 20 kesef. And then it's discovered that there is a kesef, a cup of silver, a kesef cup that's in Benjamin's pack. And now, in a sense, Joseph is willing to buy Benjamin as an Egyptian slave with Kaseth, just like Joseph was bought as an Egyptian slave with Kaseth. Right? Silver, silver, silver. What's really cool, like, is this intentional? Was, is this something that the writer knew about, or is this the Holy Spirit at work? The original price for Joseph was 20 Kaseth. Right? Well, the word kasef is used in this section exactly 20 times with the back and forth of the brothers. Now, at the time of Moses, hundreds of years later, slaves are sold for 30 shekels of silver or 30 kasef. And that's the price that Jesus is later sold for to Judas, 30 kasef. So it's 20 kasef in the days of Joseph. Plus inflation, right? Some things never change. There's inflation then too. So anyway, Joseph's steward confronts the brothers. They come back. He says, why have you repaid evil for good? 
the brothers are caught in Joseph's trap, right? And the brothers are so confident that they do not have the cup and they trust each other so much. They declare that whoever the thief is should be killed and everyone else should be taken as slaves. They make an oath because they're so sure that they don't have this cup, that they're innocent. This showed a lot of change with these boys. Now they have a healthy trust with each other, right? And they're, they're not pointing fingers immediately. They're not trying to throw each other under the bus or under the camel, as it were, right? And so the cup is found in Benjamin's sack. What? Not Benji. And they tear their clothes as a sign of grief. I'm, this just tears me up. And according to the oath, they would now be rid of their favorite, of the, of the favorite son, the favorite son of Jacob. And if they hated Benjamin as much as they hated Joseph, they should be glad about this. And here is the test where Joseph is watching. Clearly, they do not feel the same way about Benjamin. This was the worst thing imaginable, right? Um, Dad has already said that he's going to lower his gray head into the grave sobbing if anything happens to Benjamin. Well, before, they didn't care about their father's feelings. They didn't care about the favored son, Joseph. Now the idea of hurting Benjamin or their dad just rips them to shreds. And the brothers fall before Joe on the ground, once again for the third time. And Joseph plays this up big. Don't you know I can read tea leaves and I have magic powers? How did you think you could get away with this? And in Judah's mind, the brothers are now destined to live the rest of their lives as slaves because they had sold Joseph as a slave some 20, 22 years before this. They believe that they are now being punished because of what they did to Joseph. And then Joseph says, no, 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 you will not all stay as slaves. Only the one thief. The rest of you can go. This is just a great setup. Because if the brothers do just take off, and if they do just leave Benjamin, well, at least Joseph will still have his full brother with him. Joseph's going to win out on either case. But notice again the irony here. All the boys were against Joseph, and they sent him away to Egypt when he was innocent. Now all the boys are for Benjamin, and they will all be sent away from Egypt when he was innocent, huh? Hmm, the innocent one is charged and the innocent one is gonna pay the price of the evil, right? Huh, and it's all revolving around this precious cup, this, this chalice interwoven in the story with saving the people with bread, right? There's a lot of Jesus here. Now in the Old Testament, we often hear of a cup of suffering, the cup of wrath, that, that, that will be poured out upon the unjust. And Jesus prays famously, take this cup of suffering from me. Jesus was not guilty. He should not have had the cup. But at the Last Supper, Jesus says that the cup of suffering has become the cup of redemption. It has become the cup of the new covenant. And he's willing to take it, even though he's innocent. The covenant that now lies between Joseph and his brothers, between Egypt and Israel, is all taking place because of this precious silver cup. What beautiful imagery, what, what rich symbols and rich themes this is setting up for all the rest of the Bible. In this moment, this moment is huge, huge, huge. One of the greatest lessons of this is the story of repentance, turning away from, ch from sin, changing our lives, right? So a lot of us, many times, we think we can get away with sin. You know, like Adam and Eve, we think we could just cover ourselves up with flimsy little fig leaves and everything's going to be fine. But God is in the process of bringing these boys to a point where they're desperate. They have to make a decision. There's a reckoning. Sometimes this is the only way we'll change our ways, right? 
And Judah insists that the brothers will stick by Benjamin. And he gives the longest speech in all of Genesis. And compared to the other books of the Bible, this really is not that long. It's really not that long. And of Judah's speech, um, a lot of scholars write these amazing things. Like, it's the most moving address in all the word of God. Really? I mean, it's pretty good, but I don't think it's like the Sermon on the Mount or anything, right? I mean, it's... That's a little bit overstated, but but okay. For sure, the ramifications of this moment literally changes the history of the world. Because Judah offers his life for Benjamin and his father. Judah has distinguished himself as the one willing to be a sacrificial sacrifice, or a substitutionary sacrifice. This is love. This is a heroic self-sacrifice for the good of others that a man would lay down his life for his brother. As how, how could I possibly go to my father if the lad is not with me? Right? Now, compare this to the way these bozos had been acting just the last 10 chapters, right? There's no accusations thrown at one another. There's no compromise. There's no rivalry, no envy, no excuses. Judah here makes it very clear he's not even going to ask for mercy from Joseph because he doesn't deserve it. This is huge spiritual growth. Judah knows that what he did was terrible, absolutely terrible. And look what's happening in the heart of Judah. He begs for patience. He tells the whole family story, and he makes it clear he will do anything to avoid hurting his dad again. He's already pledged himself. He's, he's called on his father's curse for the rest of his life if he doesn't bring Benjamin back. And he tells all this to the man who Judah does not realize is Joseph. Bible stories, one of the things we want to we want to pray about and meditate on is what we call the moral action. What's God teaching us how, how to live? How is he teaching us to live? Like what's holy living here? Here the message is clear. God wants us to come to a place where we stop making excuses. He wants us to come to the place where we're willing to own up to our sins, no matter the cost. But Judah, even here, he doesn't confess everything. He doesn't give any details about how his brother Jojo vanished. The confession kind of comes out like an onion. It kind of comes out in layers. He's still trying to kind of protect himself a bit. But God is patient. God is gentle. He knows what we feel. He knows what we're going through. The book of Hebrews in the New Testament says Jesus was tempted by all things just as we are. So the absolutely shocking thing is that Judas does not, or that Judah does not beg. He doesn't lay out a case for Joseph to free them all. He simply says, please allow me to remain as your slave instead of Benjamin. Like our Lord, Jesus asking for the privilege to suffer on behalf of others, others who are guilty, Judah is willing to suffer. Wow. Now, a thought comes to me, and this doesn't happen very often. So these brothers are all facing these terrible situations. Joseph has gone through all this suffering. Jacob is ready to die of sorrow. God is allowing all this because he loves them. God is determined to get their attention and to bring them back into right relationship with him. God allows our suffering because he loves us. All this difficulty is happening because they're wrestling with God. When they finally surrender to what's holy and right, when they, when they own up to reality, things begin to shift. God didn't just say, whatever, forget them, shrug his shoulders, and go off and try to find someone else. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. 
So in chapter 45, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. This is this is really a big deal. He orders all of the Egyptians out of the room so he can be alone with his brothers. There's a medieval Jewish rabbi named Ramden, and he taught that Joseph made the other Egyptians leave the room to protect his brothers. If the Egyptians had heard that these wicked men had sold their own brother into slavery, they surely would be considered a threat to Pharaoh. Joseph didn't want his brothers to be despised and feared. He protected their reputation. Isn't that awesome? Another, another you know, mark on the side for Joseph here. And the response of the brothers is total shock. The Hebrew word is bahal, dismayed. They were amazed or frightened or terrified. Bahal. And and Joseph says, come to me. That implies that, you know, the brothers were cringing in terror. Jewish legend says the brothers were so shocked their souls left their body. And it was only a miracle of God that their souls came back. <laughs> you know, they thought he was dead. And now he's walking among them. And he, they didn't recognize him. He once was dead. Now he's alive. Does that sound familiar? Ring any bells? Now, Joseph then gives his testimony, and he says, don't be grieved or angry. He honestly states their sin of many years ago. Yet he has so much compassion. He's past his grief. He's past his anger. He wants his brothers to be able to be past it, too. Joseph saw that God's good purpose in all this was greater than the evil of his brothers. He said famously, he said, you sold me, but God sent me. What a great line. You sold me, but God sent me. And the brothers just sit there with their mouths open. They don't say anything for 11 verses. Right? And then Joseph tells his brothers, go home, bring dad back. And, and and find protection from the famine. And he, he kisses his brothers. He weeps on them. He's affectionate and loving. He doesn't exclude the ones that were especially cruel to him. His heart's open to all of them as a group and as individuals. And his brothers talk with him. Oh, it's so wonderful. There's a lot to catch up on. Wouldn't it be awesome? Don't you just wish... You can know the details of that conversation. Like that would just be an amazing scene to watch. Now in this, we have to realize there can be no reconciliation without confession. Repentance requires remorse. Confession has to have some form of contrition, sorrow for sin. Joseph had every right to imprison them kill them, make them suffer. Justice would call for punishment. But Joseph offers mercy. So um, they returned to Canaan with carts from Egypt, right? Pharaoh and Joseph sent them with tons of gifts. This is the kind of stuff legends would be made of. I mean, massive amounts of wealth and they're parading in and, 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 Joseph says to them, <laughs> see that you don't be troubled along the way. In other words, don't you dare get angry with each other. Don't you get, dare quarrel or argue. He knew these men very well. He, he knew who they were. They would be tempted to act in selfish, unspiritual ways. So he's kind of anticipating that. And another great twist of irony, the brothers are all given festive garments, like coats of long length, coats of many colors. Oh, how beautiful is God's little twist of humor. And Benjamin gets five great festive garments. So they get back to Canaan. Jacob cannot believe them. And, and notice something here really closely as you're looking through some of these chapters. Notice that sometimes he's called Jacob and sometimes he's called Israel, like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Or if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, it's like that conversation where Gollum and Smeagol has within himself, 
when he's torn about what he's supposed to do. It's like two people living inside one person. When Jacob was in charge, we saw kind of a self-pitying, complaining, unbelieving man who totally forgets to turn to the Lord. And then when he's Israel, he's the man who wrestled with God and he seemed to remember the covenant and at least a touch of faith and God speaks to him when he's Israel. So interesting. Now there's not a record of the brothers full confession to Jacob about what they did to Joseph. Some think that they came clean and they told him all the details. Um, some think not. They spared them the details. We're not really told exactly what's said. So then in chapter 46, the family comes back to Egypt. God speaks to Jacob on the way back. More than 40 years before, when Jacob was about to leave the promised land, God spoke to him in a dream, right? The stairway to heaven in Bethel. Now when he's about to leave the land again, God speaks to him through a dream, through visions of the night again. And he says, don't fear to go down to, to Egypt. Why would he be afraid? Well, Jacob probably knew that God told Abraham, his grandfather, that the descendants of Abraham would be strangers in a land that is not their own. This is back in chapter 15, if you remember way back then. They will be held as strangers in a land not their own, and they will, they will have to serve the, these other people, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. So as Jacob leads his family to the foreign land, he doesn't really know what's happening. And God says, don't fear. I'm telling you to go to Egypt. I'm, unlike grandma and grandpa, I never told them to go. I'm telling you to go. And I will make of you a great nation there. His purpose is to bring this clan to Egypt. As I mentioned last week, if the family didn't go to Egypt, might just be assimilated among the people, the pagan tribes of Canaan, and they would lose their distinctiveness. God has called them to a place where they can grow, yet remain religiously separated, at least for a time. Joseph will put his hand on your eyes, the Lord says. In other words, he's, he's going to close your eyes in the sleep of death. The final assurance was that he will see Joseph again and Joseph will care for him until his dying day. This is a very sweet assurance. Now, this is the last time that scripture tells us of God directly talking with the Israelites or the, or the, patri the patriarchs here for the next 400 years. There's no mention of God speaking to them while they're in Egypt until the time of Moses when God is going to grow this little tribe into a nation and talk to Moses through a burning bush. Then there's a list of Jacob's family. His descendants are brought down. This shows um, great faith that Israel had. He brings his entire family to Egypt. No one's left behind. The sons of Judah are given special note because of, of the lineage of the Messiah. And it says the total number of males in the clan was 70. So there were 66 plus Jacob, Joseph, and Joseph's two sons. This large family would become a nation of people, perhaps 2 million people over the next 400 years. Exodus and, and Numbers tells us 600,000 men left Egypt during the Passover. So most scholars estimate there'd be over 2 million people that would be among the Jews. Interestingly, the link may be that there were 70 nations listed that came out from Noah's family way back in chapter 11 that went out to the world. Now 70 people gathered into Egypt. And later, Jesus is going to send out 70 disciples to go back out to the regions. There's, there's a lot of back and forth of 70 through the scripture. So in the Greek version of the Bible, the Septuagint, and then also in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen, uh, who's the first martyr, he recounts the story here of, of, of Abraham 
and of Jacob. Stephen says there's 75 who went into Egypt. It's not a mistake because there, there were the 70 plus three more sons of Joseph and two grandsons of Joseph who were born in Egypt after the fact. So the family settles in Goshen. Okay, this is a, a green area, nice and grass grazing. It's kind of a suburb of downtown Egypt. It's far enough away yet close enough, right? And it says that every shepherd is considered an abomination to the Egyptians because the Egyptians were agricultural people in the sense of farming. But there's a really great text note in the Ignatius uh, Catholic Study Bible that kind of explains this a bit. Egyptians worshipped certain animals, including sheep. They would have detested the thought of eating them or herding them or shepherding them, offering them in sacrifice. They did not like shepherds, but they allowed them to still do it, right? They allowed them to peaceably live nearby. So we're going to wrap up chapter 47, verse 1 through 12. Jacob blesses Pharaoh. Pharaoh has acknowledged that Jacob was a man of God, and um, Pharaoh himself was thought to be a god. They considered Pharaoh the human embodiment of Ra, one of the sun gods. So this means it was absolutely remarkable that he allowed Israel to bestow a blessing on him. They have a very important conversation, very pleasant conversation. And, and Pharaoh meets up with the old patriarch. They get this nice land of Goshen. And the soap opera is coming to a happy ending, right? The soap opera is ending. It's like, it's like the, you know, the sitcom episode that ends very happily we think there's a pause in the drama for just a few verses but when we pick up the drama continues and we'll end the entire book of Genesis next week with the blessings and the curses of the people of Israel that's a ton of stuff today I hope that wasn't too fast um, so hold on tight a lot more next week that's very interesting thanks everyone God bless Thank you so much for walking with us through this study of the book of Genesis.